So we found two ways to solve this problem. We had, um, first we had the velocity, so we could use an antiderivative to figure out what the position was, and then just find the difference in the two positions. That would tell us the net distance traveled. The other way we had was, was because the velocity wasn't constant, we couldn't just take rate times time equals distance, but if we sliced really thin, the velocity would be approximately constant over a short interval. And then we could take rate times time equals distance and sum up all the distances to get the answer. Now, this is actually going to be a pretty useful technique. A lot of times in a problem, if you have a quantity that's changing, and that's what's making it hard to solve the problem, you can slice it up into thin slices where that quantity is approximately constant, and then you can approximate the answer. By slicing finer and finer and finer, you get closer to the actual answer. Now you might want to, you might ask, well, why would we want to do that when we could just find an antiderivative? We would avoid the whole limit process. And that's um, actually true, although sometimes it can be difficult to find the antiderivative, in which case we could actually find the antiderivative by computing the sums of slices. Um, other times, just solving the problem, we set up what kind of area it is we're calculating or figure out what we need to find the antiderivative of by slicing, and then we actually just find the antiderivative to answer the problem rather, rather than doing these slices. This idea that there's a connection between summing up tiny slices and, and finding antiderivatives is what's called the fundamental theorem of integral calculus. And we're going to um, elucidate that as we go further this week until we understand it completely. Before we go too much further, though, I hope you'll notice that keeping track of these thin slices um, is actually pretty difficult and uh, paper consuming, so it takes a lot of handwriting to do that. What we need is some shorthand notation. If we're going to be summing up a bunch of numbers, we're going to need a faster way of writing it. Now, the system that we've devised is called sigma notation. Now, this is capital sigma in the Greek alphabet. It's the equivalent of s, so sigma as in s for sum. So sometimes this is also called sum notation. Now the idea is if we want to add up a bunch of things, we'll put a sigma in front of them and that will stand for sum. And then the things that we're summing up will usually depend on some index i. Now the index usually starts at 1 but could start at any number and goes until it reaches some upper value. And then the things that we sum up will depend on that particular um, index. For example, maybe we want to add up uh, 2i plus 3. So we want to do that. Okay, and this lets us put a lot of terms, actually n terms. I haven't even specified how many yet. This lets us compactly write a whole bunch of terms. For example, if I try to do this for i equals 1 to, oh, say 4, add up 2i plus 3, what that would mean is we have this index. The index is starting at 1, and it always increases by 1 until it reaches the value up at the top of the sigma here. So this is the upper value. Now what we're adding each time is actually 2i plus 3. So I use my index to calculate what number I'm adding this time. When the index is 1, 2 times 1 is 2, plus 3 makes 5. Uh, 2 times 2 is 4, plus 3 makes 7. 2 times 3 is 6, plus 3 makes 9. And 2 times 4 is 8, plus 3 makes 11. So basically, this notation is just a compact way of writing 5 plus 7 plus 9 plus 11. Now you might say, well, that didn't save too much space. But of course, if I um, maybe triple the number of terms I want to add, maybe I want to go out until i equals 12, the notation stays pretty short, even though if I were to write this sum out, now I have 5 plus 7 plus 9 plus 11 plus 13 plus 15 plus uh, 17 plus 19 plus 21 plus 23. Whoops, I've almost lost count. There's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, um, 11, 12 terms there. Now I said the, the, the base, the starting value for the index uh, doesn't necessarily have to be 1. It could be. You can always tell how many terms there would be if you take the top number and subtract 1 less than the bottom number. 1 less than 1 in this case is 0, so 12 minus 0 means there should be 12 terms there. Anyway, the point is that this notation basically is a little recipe for the sum that encapsulates the sum without having to write out so much, right? You could, you could go even further. Like, you'd never want to write out 112 terms of this sum, but you could still compactly represent it using this sigma 
notation. So basically we have the terms. These generally depend on the index. So a lot of times the terms are denoted by a letter sub i to indicate that this letter is a variable and that variable depends on the value of the index. And then i is the index. This is the lower bound of the index. Okay, and that's the upper bound for the index. The index always uh, steps by one. So wherever you start with, you just keep increasing by one until you reach the upper bound for that index. Now, that sum that we just discussed, the sum from i equals 1 to 12 of 2i plus 3, there are rules that can help you simplify sums. Now here's, here are a couple first. If you have some sum, doesn't matter where it starts or ends, but if you have the same number that's always multiplying them, then let's see, what we would have here is whatever, um, I, when i is 1, then we get a sub 1, that's some number that depends on i, plus we have that constant c. See how the c doesn't have a little note on it, so it doesn't seem to depend on i. c times a2 plus c times a3. This is going to go on, right, until we get c times the very last term. But of course, because of the distributive property backwards, we can factor out that constant c from each of those terms. And now we see this could be denoted using sigma notation as the constant c times the sum from i equals 1 to n of a sub i. That's our first rule. You can pull a constant through. If there's the same number multiplying each term in a sum, basically because you can factor it out, you can just bring it out in front of the sum. Just add up the basic numbers, and once you've got that sum, multiply that result by c. Another rule that we have for simplifying sums is if the things that we're summing are actually sums themselves, so let's say in, for each term we're taking one number that we calculate from the index plus another number that we calculate from the index, then what we're going to have is a1 plus b1 plus, um, in fact, let me write that I'm out this way. I'm going to have a1 and then I'm going to have b1 and then I'm going to have a2 and b2 and a3 and b3 and so on. This pattern is going to keep occurring, right, until we get to the last term, which is a n plus b n. So I need to sum up all of these numbers here, but you can see you can add in any order, so I could get the same answer by summing up all of the first parts and summing up all of the second parts and adding the two together. So there's another rule for simplifying sums. Now, aside from the rules that we have that work for any sum, you know, if we have any sum and there's a constant multiplying the terms so that this constant's not changing, only these numbers are changing as the index changes, then we can pull the constant through. So that's one general rule we've seen. And the other one would be if we had the sum from some lower bound to some upper bound of a sum which actually consists of two numbers that you calculate based on the index. You can add in any order, and so you could add up all of the first numbers and then add to that the sum of all of the second numbers. Those work um, no matter how the, the, the uh, terms are um, determined from the index. Um, there are some rules that we can use in some specific cases for some specific sequences. One of those rules is this, if you're going to add up the sum from i equals 1 to n of some constant, then really you're just adding up c n times, so that sum will turn out to be c n. Here's another one, if you're doing the sum from i equals 1 to n of i, what we're talking about here is we're taking 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus and so on, we're going to keep going, let's see, the third to last term would be n, or, or, uh, yeah, n minus 2, and then n minus 1, and then finally we're going to add in the last term n. Now for this specific sum, where you're adding up the first n integers, um, there's, a, there's a quick trick for evaluating it. First, notice that if you take the first and the last, the sum of those two is n plus 1, but then the second and the second to the last their sum is also n plus 1. You can see that's true because 
this one increased by 1, while that one decreased by 1, and so there was no net change in the sum of the two. Same thing if I pair these together, that's equal to m plus 1. So we can see what that sum is going to be because we have, um, basically, there are n terms. So there would be n over 2 pairs, and each pair sums to n plus 1. So the sum has got to be equal to n times n plus 1 all over 2. So this is a rule that we can now use. If you have the sum from i equals 1 to n of i, then the answer is going to be the top index times n plus 1 all over 2. This actually would be handy for evaluating that sum that we saw before, which was the sum from i equals 1 to 12 of 2i plus 3. What we could do is, um, we're summing up those, right? So first we could apply this general property for sums and say that's the sum from i equals 1 to 12 of 2i plus the sum from i equals 1 to 12 of the constant 3. See how I broke that sum apart? Now this 2 is a constant that's multiplying every single term in the sum, so I can factor it out, basically pull it through. So we're going to have 2 times the sum from i equals 1 to 12, plus the sum from i, 1 to 12 of i, sorry, plus the sum from i equals 1 to 12 of 3. And now we have formulas for both of these cases. First we have 2 times, if you're adding up the first 12 integers according to this formula, you're going to take 12 times 12 plus 1 over 2. So that's 12 times 13 over 2. And then if you add up 3 12 times, then you're going to get, um, if you add up some constant a certain number of times, then you're going to get 3 times 12. Okay, so we can actually simplify a little bit. We have the 2's cancel here, so the sum is going to be 12 times 3, 12 times 13 plus 12 times 3. Um, factor of the 12, we have 12 times 16 there. And that's going to be 120 plus 72, so 192 for that sum.